So we were talking about um, nitrogen assimilation, and one of the things that kind of links two of the lecture topics, the two most recent lecture topics together, is this idea of here's carbon metabolism down the middle here with glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. And remember that I said that one of the key aspects of carbon metabolism, carbon metabolism is that in addition to energy production, it is the starting point for the biosynthesis of all other types of macromolecules, all types of biological molecules, so amino acids and lipids and, and carbohydrates and proteins. And as we'll see in today's lecture, also all these secondary products are coming from carbon skeletons in the same way. So it's important to, to recognize that these two are integrated. So a common question that I've asked students in previous years on exams are things related to what happens if you take a plant and nitrogen starve it? What happens to photosynthesis? What happens to carbon metabolism? So you should be able to see that, you know, that, that these are the source of proteins for cells to be able to continue to grow, continue to be able to do photosynthesis. It's making rubisco, right? Um, so that the inability to produce carbohydrates is going to have an immediate effect on, on plant growth but it's also going to have an effect on photosynthesis because these represent sinks for the products of photosynthesis, right? We said something on the order of 1 16th of the carbon in rapidly growing cells is going to make amino acids. So you take that sink away, it should have an effect on photosynthesis. Right? It may be delayed somewhat by the, um, the ability of the plant to put carbohydrates into starch sort of that overflow mechanism we talked about, but any significant de um, decrease in the availability of, of nitrogen is going to have an, a, an effect on, on many things in the plant. Okay, the last thing I want to say something about sort of the general physiology is this rather interesting observation. So what this is looking at is the nitrogen content of transport in the xylem in a whole bunch of different plants. And so yellow represents nitrate being transported, and the other sort of blue and purple colors represent reduced um, nitrogen compounds, amines, and various types of uh, amino acids and ureides and things like this. And so what this tells us is these guys like Cockleburt that's transporting mostly nitrate, where is nitrate being reduced and assimilated into organic compounds in the roots of the leaves? leaves, right? Because you're transporting nitrate in the xylem. Where in these guys down here, where if you look at lupins, for example, they're doing most of the nitrogen assimilation in the roots. So one of the things that, that as a physiologist you should be thinking about is why, is why is there this range of things? What is it about the lupins that's different than cockleburr that makes it more, that they have chosen for presumably evolutionary reasons to reduce their nitrate to ammonia and assimilate it in the roots where cockleburr and clover and those sorts of guys are doing it in the leaves. I'm not looking for an answer now and there isn't a definitive answer. One of the things that is useful to, to recognize when thinking about this is that many of these plants are facultative, that is under some conditions they can reduce the nitrate in the roots, and under other conditions, they can reduce it in the leaves. And obviously, what those conditions are should be, you'd think would be, a clue to the evolutionary sort of picture here. But it isn't, because the, the results are all over the map. Okay, So this is another area of plant physiology that um, we don't really understand that well. Another thing that I think uh, Anna may have brought up last week when we're talking about this is, what about foliar nitrogen? What about nitrogen that falls on the leaves? Can, can leaves take up nitrogen directly in the form of nitrate or ammonia that falls on the leaves? And the answer is yes. Typically, it's not very much. But it can contribute significantly to the overall nitrogen assimilation. Yes? Oh, through the, through the leaves versus the roots? So are we talking about getting into the plant or are we talking about assimilation? Because those are two different things, right? Yeah. So when we talk about foliar uptake, we're talking about 
getting it into the leaves from the surface of the leaf versus taking it up from the soil. But this diagram is showing you not where it's taken up, but where it's assimilated, where it's reduced and assimilated. So remember when you read about, for example, phosphate. Phosphate's taken up from the soil in the same form that it's used in the rest of the plant. So you don't have to do anything to phosphate. But sulfur, for example, follows a very similar pattern to what happens with nitrate. It has to be reduced to the level of sulfide before it can be incorporated. So it's a very similar sequence of things with, with uh, nitrogen and sulfur. So sulfur assimilation also occurs in either roots or leaves. I'm not sure whether it follows the same distribution pattern or not. Okay, so let's move on then to think about the next lecture topic, which is plant defenses and secondary metabolism. And you might, on the surface, wonder why these two subjects are put together. So let's ask ourselves first, what do we mean by secondary metabolism? Or secondary products. Okay, so when you say carbohydrates, uh, amino acids, nucleic acids, and lipids, what are we talking about? Go ahead. Yeah, so what is the term we give those? Um, primary metabolites, yeah, right? So secondary metabolites, one of the easy ways to define them is they're not primary metabolites. Okay, so now we've got to define primary metabolites. What are primary metabolites? Uh, well, we'll see, for example, that gibberellins and jasmonic acid and the phytol tails of chlorophyll are all secondary products, but they serve essential functions in plants. Um, <laughs> the, you I mean the fact that you're stumbling is expected because the terminology is awkward, awkward at best. So let me try and give you something that might help. So when we, take, when we say primary metabolites, so Himi mentioned carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, um, lipids. Those are metabolites and metabolism that interconverts them that are found in all organisms. Okay? So if you go back to look at, you know, bacteria and fungi and all sorts of things, primary, primary metabolism is common to all organisms. In an evolutionary sense, it means it must be very old. It must have been common to the earliest ancestors. So secondary metabolism then means everything else. It used to be very commonly said that primary metabolism was essential and secondary metabolism is not, right? And that's what we know is just not true. There are lots of secondary metabolites that organisms cannot live without. You take them away, the organism can't live, okay? But this common to all organisms suggests that these are not common to all organisms. And so typically when we look at secondary metabolites, they show distinct phylogenetic patterns. That is, one group of plants may, able, may be able to make a certain set of compounds and another group of plants won't. I think it's important to, to, to start off this discussion with the basic idea of what do these secondary compounds do? Well, we know that some of them are critically important for life, but the majority of them are involved in things like plant defenses. So in an evolutionary sense, what would you say is the reason that plants make secondary compounds? 
Jonathan. What would, be a, what would be an explanation from an evolutionary sense for plants to make secondary compounds? If, if the plant makes the compound, does it do something for the plant? Would you expect? Yes. Yeah. What would you expect it would do? Something detrimental or beneficial? Something beneficial. Yeah. So in the, in the context of plant defenses? Yeah, right, so to, to make it taste bad or to prevent pathogens from getting into the plant, right? So our first perspective about plant secondary products is that they have been selected for by natural selection because they do something beneficial for the plant and typically something to do with secondary uh, or with um, plant defenses. The unfortunate aspect of this is that the study of most secondary products has not held this up. That is, plants seem to make a whole lot of secondary products that we can't figure out what they're doing. Or even if you do mutational analysis and knock out the ability to produce that secondary product, you don't see any effect in terms of interaction with the normal pests and stuff like that. So on one hand, you could say, okay, we're not testing all the possible range of things that compound could do. And that's, that's probably true. But these sorts of um, studies have led to a very different perspective that's not presented in the textbook, but certainly is one that people that work on these sorts of things think a lot about. And that is... What, selection, what natural selection is selecting for is not the ability to produce one specific product, but rather to be able to produce a diversity of products along some metabolic pathway in sort of hopes that some of those will be useful for the organism. That seems to be a much more consistent explanation for the tremendous diversity of secondary products that are found in plants. That is, it's not selection for one particular end product of a pathway, but rather it's selection for a whole branching pathway that makes a wide range of products in hopes that a few of those will work. This is very controversial in plant biology these days, but it's an important perspective that you need to think about in terms of the evolution and the use of these particular compounds. Okay. Yes. Does that mean the plants are produced among a uh, larger number of and more diverse secondary compounds and more successful? Because most successful in what sense? Are well, know, more selected. Selected for what? Their environment. Well, let's be more specific. What aspects of their environment? Does do these secondary products help them deal with low light? Well, no, in, I mean, I low nitrogen. So what are we talking about? We're yeah. So are, are plants that have the wider variety of these more um, resistant to pests, to, to pathogens or herbivores? And the answer is no, not in general. But let's think about it. Let's just say that a plant is, is routinely eaten by a caterpillar. And in response to that, the plant produces a compound that makes the, the plant less desirable to the caterpillar. It tastes bad or it inhibits digestion or something like that. Is the caterpillar just going to sit there and do nothing? Or will evolution in the caterpillar potentially permit it to get around the defenses of the plant? The latter, of course, right? So this is a constant battle between pathogens and herbivores and plants. The plant does something to prevent the pathogen or the herbivore, and then the pathogen and the herbivore tries to do something. Doesn't, uh, that's the wrong way to say it. That's very anthropomorphic. The, the, path, the pathogens and the, and the herbivores don't try to do anything. The natural rate of mutation give rise to 
changes that might make some of them better to to better tolerate the the things that the plant has done to try to keep them from eating or um, attacking them. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So there, there, there's now thought to be about 350,000 different plant secondary products. But that represents a relatively small range of plants that have been looked at with a broad enough scale of analytical techniques to really pick up all the secondary products. So there's probably many, many more than that out there. And how much of parameter space have we, has evolution sampled in terms of the range of compounds that it can make? Um, the guess is relatively small. So there's, there's a lot more out there that can be done. All right. So certainly one of the things that the book spends a fair amount of time talking about are the biosynthetic pathways associated with all these different compounds. And as usual, I don't care that you know the pathways. I would like you to know the general characteristics of the compounds and where they come from, and you should be thinking something about the regulation. I think we'll give one specific example about how the, the formation of these compounds is regulated. But you don't need to know all the gory details. I will, you can look up the details. You need to be able to think about how to use them. So let's start off with sort of the big picture here. So in the big picture, we've got the primary metabolism that we've largely been talking about previous to this, the formation of sugars and nucleic acids and those sorts of things. And then down here in the blue box, we've got the um, secondary metabolites. So even this diagram is wrong, because look what they've got down here. It's aromatic amino acids in the secondary metabolites. Well, aromatic amino acids, things like tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine are primary metabolites. Those are, those are common to all organisms. Right? So you can't believe everything you see in the textbooks. But basically, one of the things that we need to be thinking about is that production of secondary metabolites is a process that's in competition with growth. Right? Because plants make these things up here in order to be able to make more plant, whether it's seeds or leaves or whatever, right? But all this stuff up here is to make more plant. This stuff down here is not necessarily to make more plant. A lot of it may be defense compounds. So one question that you could ask yourself is, what fraction of the total carbon that's produced in the plant ends up in primary metabolites versus secondary metabolites? Yeah, so the, the fact that there are induced defenses tells you that the fraction that's going from primary to secondary is going to increase under those conditions, right? So, but if the plant decides to do that, that means it's sacrificing primary metabolites in order to do those. So if we look at sort of the, the extremes, the, plant, the cells that produce the lowest amount of secondary metabolites are the meristematic cells. Those are cells that are just there to divide and make more cells. They are not sitting out on the front line of plant defenses and stuff like that. They are there to make more cells. So in meristematic cells, it's on the order of maybe 10% of the carbon goes to secondary metabolism. But in epidermal cells, as much as 50% of the carbon can go to secondary products. In cells that have lignified cell walls, so particularly tracheids and vessel elements and xylem, that lignin is a secondary product. So that can be a big component of it as well. So if we think only about the difference between herbaceous plants and woody plants, right, then just that contribution to lignin is a very important one because herbaceous plants don't put, make anywhere near as much lignin as a as a woody plant does, okay? So the, the key aspect of this is to recognize that there has to be some important regulation that separates these two sets of metabolism, right? You can't just have it be sort of random because that would be detrimental to the primary metabolites and their role that they play in growth. Okay. Um, 
So let's make a list of some of the things that these secondary metabolites do. So we've got at the top of the list plant defenses. What else do primary metabolites do? I mean, hormones. Yeah. So some, many plant hormones. So that right away tells you that we can't use that definition of not necessary because you, t you take away the ability to produce those hormones, the plants don't live. Stella? Uh, some attract yeah, attractants. And those can be either color or smell. And they can be attractants for pollinators, but they can also be attractants for seed dispersal. So tomatoes are a nice red color like that because it entices deer or other types of organisms to eat then and then spread the seeds in their fecal material. What else? What about chlorophyll? Well, I mean, we don't have it. We don't have it? Yep. But is chlorophyll a, is a chlorophyll a secondary metabolite? I don't think so. I mean, plants don't grow without chlorophyll. Plants cannot grow without chlorophyll. So, is the chlorophyll molecule a secondary metabolite? So Him saying yes. Anybody else want to take a guess at this? <laughs> yeah. Right. So. In fact, the chlorophyll molecule has got two parts to it, right? It's got the, the porphyrin ring, the head group with all the nitrogens and the metabolism in it, the metabolism, the magnesium in it. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I told you it's been a long weekend. Um, that part is part of primary metabolism. That's like hemes and things like that. They're all related to each other. But the phytol tail, that fatty, that fatty um, greasy tail, is a secondary metabolite. So chlorophyll kind of gets to be a problem because it's sort of step, it's got part of it that's up here and part of it that's down here. Can you make photosynthetic organisms if you took off the phytol tail of the chlorophylls? You cannot. It won't work. So do you want that definition that I gave of primary and secondary metabolites to work for every single compound in every single situation? You're going to be unhappy because it won't. Get used to it. That's the way biological terminology works. I would never ask you a question, is chlorophyll a primary or secondary metabolite? Right. Well, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? So it's not weird, it's both definition and your definition of attractants at point. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I am never going to ask you for, you know, is this a primary or secondary metabolite? But if I say, if I define some kind as being primary and some kind of as being secondary, you should be able to tell me something about what their different, what you would expect their differences to be. Okay. So are allergies then secondary? Yeah. So what about carotenoids? Those are those are secondary metabolites in the, in terms of metabolism. How about in terms of Necessity for growth of the plant. Can you ha can carotenoidless mutants grow? You may not know the answer to it, but the answer is no. Except under very very low light intensity, they don't grow. Without carotenoids, they toast themselves from the inside out because of production of reactive oxygen species. Okay, so your questions are good ones, and that's why I don't want you to get lost in the books or my definition of primary versus secondary. Think of the general picture and don't try to apply it you know, specifically to every single compound because it won't work for every single compound. Okay? So, back to our list. We're missing anything important here? Say that again? Pigments. So, but pigments, are they that go into the attractants part of this? Or are you talking about photos, photosynthesis and Yeah, so let's put photosynthesis in here. So both in terms of accessory pigments and photoprotection, right? Yes, so certainly they play an important role in there. Are we missing anything? Yeah, we're missing one important thing. 
Say that again. Repellents. Repellents. Well, that sort of fits into this plant defenses, right? That's, that's keeping uh, pathogens or herbivores from, from attacking or eating the plants. Um, well, lignin is actually, well, sort of plant defenses, but it's also, yeah, we should put something in here for, say that again, structural, would you like that? In the contents of lignin. Lignin also falls into plant defenses, we'll see, because it's very hard to break down. What about specific enzymes? Like enzymes that are in common to all others, are those secondary? No, those would all be primary metabolites because they're made of amino acids. Yeah. Okay? There's one important thing that we're missing in here, and that's UV protection. So I would treat that differently than the photoprotection we're talking about here because UV light has a, the, it, it's a shorter wavelength, so what does that mean about the energy of the photons? Higher energy, and higher energy means the potential to do more damage. And UV light has the potential to damage a lot of things. The main thing that it can damage is DNA, right? So UV protection, plants basically have sunscreen in their epidermal cells that are derived from secondary products. The, it's, is it different than the UV protection that we have? Different compounds, but similar mechanisms. It's basically, it's basically like sunscreen. It absorbs very effective. They absorb very effectively UV light. Okay, so let's just finish up the sort of general introduction here by also recognizing something that's become really important about plant secondary products, and that is that humans are interested in them. So one of the first ones that humans were interested in was natural rubber, right? So rubber is a um, big polymer in the, in the terpene group. We'll talk more about it in just a minute. But its uses have been, I mean, it has been used for a long time, but obviously became more important in the mid-19th century when people started making tires and things like that out of it. So that's, that was one of the earliest ones. But these days, one of the main use for plant secondary products is as medicines. And that's a really interesting um, We know where that comes from, because if you go back and look at um, traditional uses of plants in medicine. Um, or for other purposes. So for example, the Quechua Indians that live in the Andes have chewed cocaine leaves for, coca leaves for, for centuries to deal with altitude sickness. It's very effective. I don't know if you've, any of you have ever been at high altitudes, but if you go to the Andes and you're having trouble, like you want to go to visit Machu Picchu and you're having trouble with the altitude, get some coca tea. It's extremely effective of dealing with altitude sickness. Now, obviously, there's potential side effects if you use too much of it, but just drinking coca tea won't, won't do much to you other than make you much more capable of withstanding the, the bad effects of, of altitude. So these sorts of things that have been around for centuries have given people the idea that there are compounds in plants that are useful for doing all sorts of different things. Well, I have a graduate student that spent the first two years of her PhD thesis in South Africa collecting plants that people traditionally use for dealing with respiratory illnesses. She's interested in compounds that are present in plants that could be used to treat tuberculosis. And in fact, she's come up with some really interesting compounds that are quite effective. So the traditional uses of plants have formed a basis of the idea that plants contain compounds that are useful. We know that this, this is extended to, in, let's say, other areas of human use. So recreational drugs, um, those are all derived from, from secondary products of plants. A lot of different types of medicines that we use are derived from secondary products of plants. And I believe that the study question for t today's lecture is asking you to think about 
whether the role that that compound plays in plants and the role that it might play as a medicine or a recreational drug or whatever, um, whether they're related to each other or not. You don't know the answer to it now, but you should better after the, after the lecture and, and uh, going back over the readings. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of emphasis these days on what's referred to as bioprospecting, basically going out and taking plants and looking for plants' ability to inhibit microbial growth or to interfere with cell division in cancer. So that's where Taxol came from. Um, lots of different studies like this, most of which are not looking for specific structures. They're trying everything they can think of and seeing what works. And that should be a clue to you about the answer to the question that I just asked you about. <laughs> um, so the question was, is there a relationship between the function in the plant and the function that we use it for as humans, medicines in particular? Um, and what I said was the way that they look for compounds is very shotgun approach. Extract compounds from every plant that they can think of and try them against, you know, tuberculosis and cancer cells and, and other types of infections and see what happens. That's the basic approach. Okay, so let's go on to talk about the different classes of, of um, compounds, secondary products. The main classes that we're going to be talking about are the terpenes. the um, phenolics, which are probably better called phenylpropanoids. We'll see the reason for that in just a second. And then the, um, the nitrogen containing alkaloids, heterocyclics, things like that. We'll talk in more detail about all of these guys. These are the three main classes of plant secondary products, and I should go back. And they're obviously related to different biosynthetic pathways. So the nitrogen-containing ones, the phenolics, and the terpenes are derived to a large extent from different primary metabolites. And so you should expect then that there are some key enzymes that connect those primary metabolites to the formation of the secondary metabolites. And we'll talk about at least one of these over the course of this lecture. Okay, so terpenes. Terpenes are an interesting group of compounds that are all derived from one common precursor. That common precursor is isoprene. Uh, let's see, we need a double bond there. We need an H there, and that's it. Sorry. So this is, let's see, let's do it this way. That's isoprene. It's a five carbon compound. And that isoprene, interestingly, can be, in plants can be formed by two different biosynthetic pathways. One that's in the cytoplasm, the yellow one over here, that goes through mevalonic, um, me <laughs> mevalonic acid and another one that's in the chloroplasts. This one in the chloroplasts has only recently been discovered. Both of them make, the endpoint of those pathways are making this five carbon isoprene compound. And isoprene is the precursor for all the terpenoids. And basically what happens is to make isoprenes, two five carbon, sorry, five carbon isoprenes combine to make what's referred to as a mono my writing is bad today monoterpene that has ten carbons and you can add another five carbon to this to make a sesquiterpene Again, you don't need to know all the terminology. You can look it up. There are diterpenes that have 20, triterpenes that have 30 carbons, tetra, 
terpenes, so they have 40 carbons. We'll talk a little bit about some of the, the, um, the different um, uses of these different compounds. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of the discovery that there are two different pathways for isoprene biosynthesis is that these various classes of terpenes are made in different places in the cell. So let me make sure I get this right because I don't remember it. It's all new. Yeah, so the 15 carbon and the 30 carbon ones are the ones that are made in the cytoplasm. And the 10, 20, and 40 are the ones that are made in the plastids. And the f evolutionary reason for this may be somewhat related to that the 20 and 40 carbon ones are precursors for the phytol tails of chlorophyll and of carotenoids. So those are things that have photosynthetic use. Where the 15 and 30 carbon ones we'll see have different uses. So the fact that these are formed in plastids may mean that they are the, this pathway that's involved in their biosynthesis was inherited from the endosymbiont that gave rise to chloroplasts, where these 10, 20, or sorry, 15 and 30 were pathways that were available in the host cell in the original endosymbiotic event that gave rise to chloroplasts. So rather interesting evolutionary perspective there. Okay, so what are these various compounds used for? There's um, ones that we're actually fairly familiar with, the 10 and 15 carbon terp terpenes, so the mono and sesquiterpenes. A large number of these are essential oils. Essential lot, not like being essential for the growth of the organism. Essential like having a scent, smell, right? So these are compounds. I think I've got some examples here. Yeah, so limonene is a 10-carbon monoterpene that is um, produced in the, the, um, the skins of citrus plants. It gives citrus plants that, that sort of interesting smell. Menthol is another one. These are primarily compounds that are deterrents to insect feeding. And where those compounds are found in the plants are in glandular trichomes on the surface of the leaf. So these are little two or three cell things that stick out of the epidermis on the surface of the leaf. And the glandular trichomes have this enlarged terminal cell. And that enlarged terminal cell contains compounds like the essential oils. So they can work in one of two ways. They can, if the organism eats them, they don't taste good. Something, something about their presence deters them from eating more. But more commonly, the fact that they're exposed on the surface of the leaf means that, you I mean, you know, you can pick up a pepper, peppermint leaf and smell it, and you can smell the, the mint smell in there, right? So those can be signals to organisms. This is a plant that, from your previous experience, you should know doesn't taste good. Don't even bother, right? So they can be detractants as well as is something that actually inhibits them from, from eating it. Um, the other thing that this falls into this 10, 15 uh, carbon terpenes are resins. For any of you that have ever cut down um, or chopped up um, pine trees, fir trees, all that gummy stuff that's in the wood is resins. And resins are basically there to be deterrence to insect feeding. They just they make it hard for them to get into the wood and they're very difficult for them to digest. Um, a group that's very important are the 30 carbon ones, 
the um, triterpenes, and these are important as sterols. So sterols like cholesterol. Cholesterol isn't made in plants, but it is a sterol, and it's sort of related to these 30 carbon compounds. But plants make lots of different sterols, and they play a huge role in membrane fluidity. So this is another one where, okay, um, they're absolutely essential for organisms, plants, to be able to grow. So let's not argue over whether those are primary or secondary. Um, let's see, the 20 carbon ones, one of its primary uses is phytol, the fatty acid tail or the fatty tail that's present on chlorophyll molecules. And the 40 carbons are um, carotenoids. These aren't the only things that any of these groups are used for. They're just one of the major examples of what they're used for. There's lots and lots of different things, as we'll see over the course of the lecture, that fall into this category. Um, the 20 carbon ones, another important one, is um, some hormones. Ipsizic acid and gibberellic acid, we'll see, are t derived from 20 carbon diterpenes. Okay, so oh, one of the other things that I want to say about these guys, the fact that these are essential oils means essential means that they, we smell them. If we smell them, it means they're volatile. That means those compounds can be released into the air. And one of the things we'll see, at the, we may not get to it today, but at the end of the lecture we'll do on Thursday, is that one of the things that's recently been discovered is that these volatile compounds can play a role in signaling between different plants, even between different species. That is, release of some volatile compounds in this essential oil category can be a signal to neighboring plants, get ready, some pathogen or some herbivore is coming, to help them cue up their defenses to be ready to deal with, uh, with whatever's coming. Okay, we'll talk more about that in, in just a couple of minutes. Let's move on to talk about the phenolics or the phenylpropanoids. So if you remember your organic chemistry, oops. Uh, nope. Not even drawing it right. I'm really not doing very well today. Let's try again. It's a six member ring, not a five member ring. And phenol looks like this. But the phenylpropanoids are more commonly derived from a six member ring, same way, but then having one, two, three carbons with an acid here at the end. And the majority of the compounds in this group of secondary products are derived from this structure. If you remember your amino acids, which I don't expect you to, if you put there, that's phenylalanine, right? So we'll see that phenylalanine is the immediate precursor for most of these compounds. Okay, so just looking at the overall mechanism for synthesis of these guys, the vast majority of these compounds are derived from phenylalanine. Phenylalanine synthesis, the primary metabolism that makes phenylalanine and all of the aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, comes from the shikimic acid pathway. It's a sort of standard pathway for amino acid biosynthesis and primary metabolism. In the conversion of phenylalanine to cinnamic acid, we'll see that this one step is the main step that is involved in that boundary between primary metabolites and secondary metabolites, because phenylalanine is an amino acid. It's a primary metabolite. Okay? 
And we'll talk about the, the, some of the different types of structures that are involved, uh, involved in this. So, but the various groups that are, that are produced in the phenylpropanoids, tannins, who knows what tannins are? Yeah, they're in wine and tea and things like that. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're important for a couple reasons. From human perspective, they add interesting tastes of things. They're, sort of, they're typically kind of astringent. And what was the last thing you said? Yeah, they bind to proteins. And so from the plant's perspective, they are anti-feeding compounds because they interfere with the uptake and digestion of proteins. Right? So if an insect eats something that's got a lot of tannins in it, it makes it very hard for the insect to get much nitrogen out of whatever it ate because it can't break down the proteins because they're all tied up in the tannins. But again, humans are interested in tannins because of the taste that they give to wines and teas and a lot of different spices. Okay, this main pathway here ends in lignin, and certainly lignin is probably the most important phenylpropanoid from the perspective of total amount made just because any of these trees out here, a big part of the cell walls of the, the xylem in the, those trees is lignin. Right? So there's a lot of lignin going there. But we'll see that there's a whole range of other compounds that are made from these as well, including things like flavonoids. Flavonoids are compounds that um, we'll see play a lot of different uses. We already talked about one of them. The roots of legumes release flavonoids into the soil, we said, to interfere with other plants growing too, too close. But in addition, that flav those flavonoids are the signals to rhizobia to say, here's a, here's a good home with free carbon. Come this way and let's make a symbiosis. Okay, so we'll talk about a number of the different different types of products that are formed here. But let's think about the, um, the regulation. Well, let's think about the range of products here first. So here's phenylalanine up at the top. This is a primary metabolite. And the first step in f the formation of most of the phenylpropanoids, as I said, is the removal of that ammonia group to produce this six carbon ring with a three carbon acid sticking off of it, cinnamic acid. And that is the precursor for most of the, most of the phenylpropanoids that we're going to talk about. And what I want you to see, it's not important that you know the names of all these, these guys, but each of these steps in a sequence of biosynthetic reactions is the starting point for production of a large number of different types of compounds. Okay, so the lignins are all derived from um, derivatives of cumeric acid. So you, there's three or four different derivatives of cumeric acid, which we'll see can polymerize to form lignins. Um, coumarins, who knows what coumarins are used for in humans? Any of you have parents that are taking heart medicines, blood thinners? Coumarins are blood thinners. Um, in plants, they obviously play important roles in, in some sort of defense that we'll talk about in, in just a minute. Okay, so if we continue this pathway down here, one of the things that we'll see is there's some interesting reactions that happen, bringing in other six carbon rings to form these interesting sort of three ring structures. So all the flavonoids and flavanols and isoflavones are derived from uh, these sorts of structures via an enzyme that you already know about for completely different reasons. In the first exam, remember, we talked about the enzyme chalcone synthase. So it's up here. It's a, it's a key enzyme in converting these, um, these guys that have a six-member ring and three carbons and adding in five more carbons to make this, this uh, second ring. Sorry, six more carbons to make the second ring. Okay, and down here at the bottom of this list, go through, going through more of these, is another group of compounds you're probably familiar with, anthocyanins. What, are anth what do anthocyanins do in plants? Yeah? 
Color, yeah, it's a big thing in color. So one of the things, if you're here in Ithaca, it's some time of year when the leaves are out, so late spring or early fall, um, a lot of the trees that are planted along the side of the road in Ithaca have purple leaves. They're called crimson king maples. They happen to be planted there because they are extremely tolerant of road salt. So you can plant the trees next to the road and they won't die from the road salt. But they happen to have high anthocyanin production in the leaves. It gives rise to the, to the, the purple color of the leaves. Any of you ever looked at um, chilling stressed plants, tomatoes for example? The leaves turn purple, particularly on the bottom side of the leaf because of anthocyanin biosynthesis. So anthocyanins play a lot of roles in colors of flowers, fruits, and leaves. Those are typically attractants. But we'll also see that anthocyanins can play a role in UV protection by absorbing UV wavelengths. They're very commonly present in epidermal cells of some types of leaves because they limit UV damage. OK. So let's look at some examples of these guys. And again, you don't need to, to uh, know all the, all the structures or names, but just to give you some idea about the sorts of things. So caffeic acid, ferulic acid, these are precursors of compounds that are involved in lignin biosynthesis. We'll see some examples of this. Here's some coumarins. So these are the guys that I said that, that we use as, as blood thinners. Um, really interesting one that people have been studying quite a bit is sorolin. Sorolin is a very uh, chemically interesting compound because um, sorolin by itself is not very uh, damaging to insects. It's an it's a anti-herbivory compound. But if it's, um, you put sorolin in the presence of UV light, it creates um, free radicals that are, can be very damaging. Um, so sorolin is a compound that, in fact, has been used if you um, buy organic, herb, um, not herbicides, um, like f mosquito killers, you know, re mosquito repellents, fly repellents, and stuff like that, they have sorolins in it because they're compounds that, you know, when they're in a can in the dark, they're, they don't do much. But if you, you know, spray it in the air and the, the, or spray it on your arm, uh, then in the presence of UV light, they will produce compounds that are pretty toxic to insects, but interestingly, not toxic to humans. And so here's some more of the compounds. So vanillin, for example, a thing that gives the, the interesting taste to vanilla beans. Salicylic acid, we'll talk about this more as a signaling molecule, but it's also, who knows what else, where, where salicylic acid comes from? Aspirin, yeah, so acetyl salicylic acid. So if you're walking in the woods, you got a bad headache, you find a willow tree, chew on the willow leaves because they're full of salicylic acid. Is it the leaves or the bark? Because they get the salicylic acid from the bark. It's, you I mean the salicylic acid um, is in the bark, but it's also in the leaves. And it's a heck of a lot easier to chew a leaf than it is to chew the bark. So that's why people <laughs> chew the leaves, right? Um, and so this diagram is showing you the basic carbon skeleton of, of uh, um, how we make flavonoids so that you get the, this part of the compound makes the one ring and the three carbons that connect it, and then from another pathway comes the carbons that make the, the other ring. And this is the basic structure associated with anthocyanins. Functional anthocyanins have sugars attached to them, a number of different types of sugars. And the anthocyanins come in all sorts of different colors, and the different colors really depend upon the number of hydroxyl groups that are attached to this ring. So minor modifications in the structure of that ring give rise to different sorts of colors that can serve particular roles in, in attractants. OK, lignin structure. Lignin is a very interesting compound because there's basically three um, phenylpropanoid compounds that form the precursive, precursors of lignins. They are all, they all have acid groups on them, they have hydroxyl groups on them, and they have methoxy groups on them. And these sorts of compounds that if you, if you initiate a free radical reaction, produce some reactive oxygen species in the presence of these compounds, 
they will spontaneously polymerize. What does that mean as far as an insect or a pathogen that needs to eat through lignin to get to the cells? It's hard to break down, but why? Go ahead, Grace. Uh, not so much because the lignin, I mean, lignin, more lignin can be formed in response to, to a pathogen attack. But there's almost always lignin there to begin with. Mm, no. Good, good try, but not right. How did I just describe this happening? Free radical reactions? Did I say anything about enzymes? No enzymes. In fact, there is one enzyme that seems to be involved in lignin biosynthesis. But the main core of this structure is non-enzymatically formed. That means the, the bonds that have been formed are not like the repetitive bonds in sucrose or in glucose or in, in uh, a starch or something like that. It's a random mess of things. It means that even if you have enzymes that can break down this one connection, it can't break down lots of other ones there. It's very difficult to break down lignin for any organism. You can break it down partially, but not very much. So lignin not only provides the structural strength to xylem tissues to prevent the, the cells from, from imploding, basically, under the, the tension that's present there, but they also provide a very strong barrier because they cannot be enzymatically degraded because they form non-enzymatically. There's no enzymes in, involved in directly the formation of the majority of those bonds. Uh, let's see. We do also have, um, we talked about tannins. And tannins, interestingly, come in two very different, structure, very different structural forms. Um, the condensed tannins are basically polymers of these building blocks of the flavonoids stuck end to end. There may be 15 or 20 of them in a condensed tannin. Where the hydrolyzable tannins have these groups that are attached to the OH groups of a common sugar molecule. Okay, so these can be broken down by breaking these bonds because these bonds are, are relatively easy to deal with. These guys are not so easily broken down. But they both have the same basic effect. I mean, tannins got their name not because of they taste good in tea or wine. They got their name because they interact specifically with collagen proteins. So when you're tanning a hide of an animal, these are the compounds that they're using. They cause the polymerization of the collagen proteins to make uh, something that's going to be much less degradable. And that's basically what tannins do as anti-feeding materials. They interact with proteins to make them less degradable. Okay. Let's move on to talk about the last group we had over here, and these were the, the alkaloids or the nitrogen-containing compounds. And there's a wide range of these guys, but most of them fall into the category of rings that are heterocyclic. That is, you may have a five-membered ring, a six-membered ring where one of those atoms is a nitrogen, or a five-membered ring. So you've seen, well, you may have seen this before. These five-membered rings are the, the where the nitrogen and are the basis of chlorophylls and hemes. It's a parole and take four of those and you make a tetraprol, which is basically a, a heme or a chlorophyll. Okay, so they play obviously lots of roles, important roles in, in plants and all organisms. But there's also a whole range of these alkaloids, ones that we're very familiar with because of their use either in legitimate medicine or in recreational drugs. So we'd have to put cocaine, nicotine, and caffeine into the categories of recreational drugs. Um, morphine, well, I guess people use that recreationally too, but it's also widely used in medicine. These compounds play in plants. Their roles are related to um, 
basically de making plant tissues less desirable for herbivores to eat. But in humans, this group of compounds is important because it interferes with brain chemistry. They, in, it, in, they interfere with signaling, synaptic signaling between neurons in your brain. They cause all sorts of obviously interesting effects. Some of which, those of you who drink coffee, hopefully you're familiar with. I hope no, none of you smoke or that none of you use morphine or cocaine recreationally, but they do some. Take, um, if, you're, if this sort of thing is interesting to you, uh, Ron Harris' work in the um, neurobiology um, department has a great class called Drugs in Your Brain or Your Brain and Drugs or something like that. And, and what they do is they, talk, they go through all these different compounds and talk about two things, where they come from and what they normally do and what they do in your body. Ah, one last group of compounds in this. Some fairly interesting ones. The cyanogenic glycosides and the glucosinolates. These are, these are interesting compounds. The cyanogenic glycosides, um, to make a long story short, they are a compound that when they are broken down, they produce hydrogen cyanide as a product. And I don't think we discussed it, but hydrogen cyanide is a very effective inhibitor of cytochrome oxidase, the last protein in mitochondrial electron transport, basically prevents oxygen from taking the electrons. So you gas chambers use hydrogen cyanide gas. When they used to um, execute people in gas chambers, it was using hydrogen cyanide gas. What mustard, gas? mustard gas is a completely different type of gas. Yeah, it has, I don't know actually what the effect is on the body. Say that again? I wouldn't doubt that it's neurological. This one is not neurological. This is metabolic. It basically stops you from being able to do, do uh, mitochondrial respiration. So. But the interesting thing about that, that's common between the two of these guys is these compounds are accumulated, for example, in um, epidermal cells. Notice that both of them have a sugar attached to them. And before these compounds can be activated, the sugar needs to be taken off enzymatically. So you'd say, okay, well, if you put these guys in plants, why don't the plants suffer from the breakdown of these compounds? And the reason why is the enzyme that is required to take off the sugars are located in different cells than where the cyanogenic glycosides or the glucosinolates are accumulated. So it means these compounds are only activated when something comes and breaks the cells, mixes the cell contents together, like in the gut of a, of a herbivorous insect. So the hydrogen cyanide or the nitriles and the ethocyanates, they're very reactive compounds that cause big problems for the organisms that eat them. So who knows where this is? What commonly eaten, uh, well, not so much in the U.S., but commonly eaten in other countries, particularly in Africa, is this a big problem in? Cassava, yeah. So cassava roots are a big starchy root that are full of cyanogenic glycosides. And so the, the somehow, you know, you, you, th you think about it in an evolutionary sense, how this worked. How did people, you know, they... They pulled out cassava roots and go, oh, this looks good. Let's eat this. You know, they eat it and they die. So how do they figure out that you got to, you wash it in water, grind it up and wash it in water several times before you could eat it? You'd think that if you ate it and died, you'd pretty much just leave it alone. But, but populations of people have figured out how to, how to deal with the presence of cyanogenic glycosides in all sorts of roots. And basically, you, bas you have to, you can boil them. It's the main thing. Just, you, you dilute these things out through diffusion. You chop them up, boil it, throw the water away, boil it again, throw the water away, then it's okay to eat. Very effective um, defensive compounds against herbivory. Okay, I want to finish up, and we won't quite finish it today, talking about 
mechanisms, two different types of mechanisms by which plants can uh, deal with herbivores and pathogens. And the basic categories we want to think about are passive mechanisms versus active mechanisms. And the, 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 the difference between these two should be pretty obvious to you. These passive mechanisms are constitutively there. They're always on. So you can, um, one passive mechanism that's present in plants is the presence of cuticle and waxes on the surface of the leaves. You know, you think about it, wax isn't a very um, inviting environment for, for bacteria or fungi to grow in. They want to be, you know, they want to get into the cytoplasm of the cells. So the production of cuticles and suberins and stuff like that are uh, one type of passive defense mechanism. Plants that constitutively accumulate certain types of compounds, so tannins that are present in tea leaves, right? Teas make those compounds all the time, whether or not there's pathogens or herbivores there. It's a constitutive mechanism. Where active mechanisms are induced, they're induced by the presence of herbivores or pathogens And the fact that they're induced means there's some level of specificity there. There has to be something that perceives the presence of the herbivore or the pathogen that then triggers some response, some active response. Okay? And this gives rise to a topic that we'll be talking about on Thursday, and that is signaling or signal transduction pathways. typically refer to these as STPs. So in the case of active or induced responses, there has to be a signal transduction pathway that we'll see involves some sort of a receiver, some sort of a receptor protein. And that receptor protein must detect something that is specific to the herbivore or the pathogen. Right? You don't want it to be turned on when I walk by and brush against the leaf. You want it to be turned on by something that is specific to the presence of the herbivore or the pathogen or the interaction of those organisms with the plant. For example, cell wall degradation products. If a, if a pathogen is trying to get into a cell by breaking down its cell wall, the cell wall degradation products can be the triggers that are detected by receptor proteins that then somehow trigger some sort of response. And in the case of these active responses, it almost always involves, involves changes in transcription. That is, to make these various secondary products that we've been talking about that weren't being made before you have to turn on the synthesis of the genes that are involved in making those products. So the basic mechanism that we're thinking about here for these active response mechanisms is that the presence of the pathogen or the herbivore trigger a signal transduction pathway, the end of which turns on the synthesis, the expression of genes that end up in the, the production of terpenes or phenylpropanoids or alkaloids and things like that to deal with the presence of these compound, uh, these organisms to try and limit the amount of damage that's going on. Okay, so let's look at some of the general pictures here. One of the, one of the main ones, we'll start off with responses to herbivores. We'll, we'll divide these into two categories, responses to herbivores and responses to, to pathogens. So herbivores, we can think of herbivores as being 
insects, chewing insects that basically eat off the leaves, or even mammals, right? Deer. <laughs> Around here, deer are big time herbivores. So I don't have any ornamental plants in my backyard anymore because of the deer. Okay, so how do plants in general deal with deer or with caterpillars that are feeding on the leaves? One of the main compounds that's involved in um, the active response mechanisms associated with herbivory is a compound, compound called jasmonic acid. Okay. Jasmonic acid is synthesized from uh, uh, an 18 carbon precursor in the chloroplasts. So linolenic acid is a is an, a fatty acid that's made only in the chloroplasts. And through a series of reactions that happens in the chloroplast and the peroxisome, jasmonic acid is produced. And jasmonic acid is a signaling, is, a, is in this case, an intracellular signaling molecule. So cells that are, have been uh, in contact with neighboring cells that have been damaged by eating, Something produced by the eating, very commonly proteins that are present in the saliva of the, of the eating insects or the deer, act as uh, triggers. And these triggers are often referred to as elicitors. That's, uh, that's these compounds that are induced, inducing the formation of uh, the signal transduction pathway that results in the formation of geosmonic acid. So something specific to the pathogen or the herbivore. In the case of the herbivores, it's stuff in the saliva very often. Leads to the formation of geosmonic acid. And geosmonic acid is, at least in the situation we're talking about now, is an intracellular signaling molecule that tells that cell turn on the synthesis of specific genes. And your textbook has a picture of the pathway that's involved here. I don't want to spend any time on it now because this is going to be the topic that we're going to be talking about on Thursday, signal transduction pathways. So what's happening here, you know, you can look at it, you can read it. But basically, we have the presence of jasmonic acid leading to the activation of transcription of specific genes. And those, the transcription of those, of those specific genes is going to lead to production of compounds that will tend to inhibit herbivory. But this is, so far we've only been talking about intracellular responses. One of the things that plants do very effectively is if a caterpillar is put on one leaf and starts chewing, it's not just the cells that are adjacent to that chewing that produce the compounds that can inhibit herbivory. There's what's referred to as a systemic response, a system-wide response. Somehow, information about the presence of an herbivore on one leaf is sent to all the leaves. And the mechanism associated with this systemic response has just been figured out in the last couple of years, and it's a pretty interesting one. So where we saw in the um, in the individual leaf cell that's adjacent to cells that are being damaged, we saw the, the synthesis of jasmonic acid. These same compounds can produce, oops, sorry, going the wrong way. When these compounds are encountered by phloem parenchyma cells, that is, cells that are, parenchyma cells that are in the phloem tissue, when those elicitors are present, they don't produce jasmonic acid, but they produce a small protein signaling molecule that's called systemin. And the systemin diffuses from the phloem parenchyma cells to the companion cells, not very far, usually neighboring cells. And that systemin binds to a receptor that leads to the formation of jasmonic acid. So in the companion cells now, this systemin has led to the formation of jasmonic acid. Same thing that happened in the normal cells in the leaf, but triggered by a different sequence of events. The difference is 
from the companion cells that the osmotic acid is loaded into the phloem and distributed to the rest of the plant. And when the jasmonic acid is detected by other cells in the plant, then it triggers the active response mechanisms. Okay? So jasmonic acid is functioning in two different ways. Here, it is functioning intracellularly. The formation of this jasmonic acid in, for example, mesophyll cells in the leaf leads to production of compounds in that cell. Nowhere else. But those same elicitors that cause jasmonic acid to be formed in the mesophyll cells will, will turn on by a slightly different mechanism using this sort of very short distance signaling molecule, systemin that's produced in the phloem parenchyma cells, that then causes the formation of jasmonic acid in the companion cells, which means anything in the companion cells is going to go right into the phloem. And so now jasmonic acid is sent throughout the plant. And wherever jasmonic acid is encountered from the phloem sap turns on the response mechanisms. Okay, so this distinguishes a local response from a systemic response. Okay, so next time we'll finish up talking about what are the actual responses to herbivores, what sort of things are made to prevent herbivory, and we'll finish up by talking about um, active response mechanisms associated with pathogens, bacteria and fungi, and then we'll go on to go into the details of this sort of thing. What's happening in the signal transduction pathway to connect the signal, the presence of jasmonic acid, with the response turning on or turning off of certain genes.